in the last lecture i have introduced the concept of interval estimation and uh, i discussed one method of constructing the confidence intervals with a given confidence coefficient uh, this method is the method of pivoting and uh, we constructed the confidence intervals for parameters of uh, normal populations when we have uh, one sample or two sample uh, problems uh, today i will also discuss briefly in the confidence intervals for proportions that means we are uh, dealing with a binomial problem for example uh, we may have uh, people who favor a certain proposition by the government people who are uh, who uh, who can be categorized as one type in a population so if we are doing the sampling from there then to conduct the to construct the confidence intervals we can use the uh, binomial approximation to the normal distribution so let us consider confidence intervals for proportions so typically we will have the data like this that we have a sample of n observations and out of that we have x number of successes so let us define say the sample proportion as x by n we want to uh, construct the confidence interval for the parameter p that is the proportion of uh, successes in a binomial population so we can consider say p head minus small p divided by square root p q by n this converges to normal 0 1 as n tends to infinity this result is known now for n large we can approximate p by p head and q by q head that is equal to 1 minus p head so we can then write p head minus p by square root of p head q head by n as approximately normal 0 1 random variable so we can use the pivoting method by considering the interval from minus z alpha by 2 to plus z alpha by 2 this is equal to 1 minus alpha because we are considering the two points on the standard normal curve this is z alpha by 2 that is this probability is alpha by 2 and if this probability is alpha by 2 then this is minus z alpha by 2 so this in between probability is 1 minus alpha so the probability of p head minus p divided by square root of p head q head by n this is approximately 1 minus alpha so we can construct the confidence interval from here we can uh, adjust the terms so this is equivalent to we can write minus z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n less than or equal to p head minus p less than or equal to z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n that is equal to 1 minus alpha or probability of p head minus z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n less than or equal to p less than or equal to p head plus z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n that is equal to 1 minus alpha so we have the confidence interval for p here that is from p head minus z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n to p head plus z alpha by 2 square root p head q head by n so here p head is the sample proportion x by n so this is an approximate so an approximate 
confidence interval for P is constructed. We may even consider comparing two binomial proportions. For example, it could be like proportion of the people who drive a certain vehicle in city A and uh, proportion of the people who drive a certain vehicle in city B. So, the proportions may be different P 1 and P 2 and we may want to have a confidence interval for the difference to have an estimate whether uh, one of them is less than the other or uh, equal. So, we may consider confidence interval for difference in proportions. Let us consider say let x and y be independent binomial random variables with x following say binomial m p 1 and y following say binomial n p 2. So, here obviously, m and n are known we want confidence interval for p 1 minus p 2 let us say it is equal to p. Once again we will make use of the uh, approximation of binomial distribution to the normal. So, if we consider say p 1 head is equal to say x by n x by m p 2 head is equal to say y by n then p 1 head minus p 2 head minus p 1 minus p 2 divided by square root p 1 q 1 by m plus p 2 q 2 by n, where here I am using uh, q 1 is equal to 1 minus p 1 and q 2 is equal to 1 minus p 2 and uh, q 1 head is equal to 1 minus p 1 head and capital Q 2 head is equal to 1 minus P 2 head. So, this is approximately normal 0 1 as m and n tend to infinity. So, then we can write we can replace P 1 Q 1 by p 1 head q 1 head and p 2 q 2 by p 2 head q 2 head to get approximate statement of the following nature that is probability of minus z alpha by 2 less than or equal to p 1 head minus p 2 head minus p 1 minus p 2 divided by square root of p 1 head q 1 head by m plus p 2 head q 2 head by n. This is less than or equal to z alpha by 2 this is equal to 1 minus alpha. So, once again as before we can simplify. So, we can write probability of p 1 head minus p 2 head minus square root p 1 head q 1 head by m plus p 2 head q 2 head by n z alpha by 2 less than or equal to p 1 minus p 2 less than or equal to p 1 head minus p 2 head plus p 1 head q 1 head by m plus p 2 head q 2 head by n z alpha by 2 that is equal to 1 minus alpha. So, we have an approximate confidence interval for p 1 minus p 2 of this form that is p 1 head minus p 2 head plus minus square root p 1 head q 1 head by m plus p 2 head q 2 head by n z alpha by 2, where again z alpha by 2 is the point on the 
normal distributions curve. Uh, this method of pivoting as I have explained can be used for various <coughs> uh, distributions. Uh, whenever we are able to find out the pivoting quantity, uh, usually as we have seen it can be dependent upon the sufficient statistics and uh, it is also coming from the, uh, the theory of Neyman Pearson's best tests. So, now I will uh, move over to the concept of the testing of hypothesis. Let us look at the basic uh, notation and terminology for the problem of testing of hypothesis. Testing of hypothesis. Let me introduce the problem first. So, I have mentioned to you the problem of statistical inference that is we are considering certain population and we are looking at its characteristics. So, for example, we may be looking at the average heights of the uh, say adult males in an ethnic group, we may be considering say uh, average precision or the precision of a measuring instrument measuring device which is used for measuring something we may be considering the amount of uh, symmetry or asymmetry present in a, a curve. We may be interested in estimating the average life of a uh, electronic component and so on. Now, in this we are making that uh, we are considering we are having no, no prior knowledge about the parameter. So, we consider estimation, but there could be another type of thing. For example, we have a certain brand for a particular uh, item. Now, a new brand of that item has been introduced in the market. Naturally, the manufacturer or the uh, shopkeeper or the customer will be interested to know whether the average longevity or the average life will be more than the previous brand. Suppose, there is a drug which is being used for curing a certain disease. Now, a uh, R and D division of the a drug company, it introduces a new drug in the market. It create uh, farm finds out or it invents a new drug. Now, certainly everybody will be interested to know whether the new drug is more effective in curing the same disease than the previous. They may be looking at its efficiency in the terms of less time taken, the proportion of people who are get getting cured that can be more or the average cost of the medicine and so on. There can be several factors that can be used to test. That means, here we may have some information about the parameter, but we want to test. So, this is called the problem of testing of hypothesis. We can roughly say that it is an statement about the, uh, since we are dealing with the parametric methods, we can say it is some statement about the parameters of a population. In general, uh, a, a hypothesis would be any statement about the probability distribution. For example, you may even say that okay, uh, we want to test whether the data is coming from a normal population or the data is coming from a gamma population. That could be a more general statement of the uh, testing of hypothesis problem. But in the beginning, we will restrict attention to the parametric methods. That means, the population is identified, but we want to test something about the parameters values, whether the value is equal to something or it is less than something and so on. So, we pose the problem in the following fashion. So, let x 1, x 2, x n at our disposal we have a random sample. Let x 1, x 2, x n be a random sample from a population say p theta, theta belongs to parameter space theta. This theta could be a scalar or a vector. A statistical hypothesis is an assertion about the 
parameter of a of the population so for example a drug for curing a certain disease is found to be effective in say in 50% of the cases so if we use the notation say p for the proportion of patients who are successfully cured using this drug then with this drug p is equal to half or p is equal to 0.5 now a new drug is introduced and let p star be the proportion of patients who get cured using this then we will be interested to find out whether p star is greater than 0.5 or not so i have stated the problem in a very uh, simple terms that we want to make some statement about the parameter of a population so here it could be like you take observation that means you consider a sample of patients out of that you find out how many get successfully cured and not and based on that you will conduct a statistical procedure so let us discuss this so we will firstly we will try to write down a hypothesis in this fashion we write a hypothesis like this we describe a hypothesis as say h not p star greater than 0.5 or some we may say h1 p star is equal to 0.5 or h2 say p star is less than 0.5 or say h3 p star is equal to 0.75 and so on these are various statements in each of them we are actually identifying the value of the parameter in some cases we are telling a range in some cases we are exactly specifying now uh, now uh, in general hypothesis testing problems uh, the common formulation that we give we firstly have a statement for example we may like to say p star is equal to 0.5 or p star is greater than 0.5 then if we make a statement this this is called a null hypothesis and then we test against another one so that is called an alternative hypothesis now this type of formulation for testing of hypothesis problems was developed by jerji neman and e s pearson in 1926 onwards in a series of papers where they developed this theory in this formulation we have a null hypothesis say h not so let us say if we are considering say normal distribution with parameter theta and say variance sigma square we may like to test whether theta is equal to 0 against an alternative hypothesis say h1 theta is equal to 1 we may write in different ways also like h0 theta is less than or equal to 0 against say h1 theta is greater than 0 
we may like to write h naught sigma square is equal to 1 against say h 1 sigma square is greater than 1. We may like to write h naught mu sigma square is equal to 0 1 versus h 1 mu sigma square is not equal to 0 1 and so on. So, there can be various uh, hypotheses which may be required to be tested. Uh, now, we make a simple classification here, when the value of the parameter specifies the distribution itself. For example, here in this binomial testing problem, if we say p star is equal to 0 0.5, then the distribution is completely specified. This is called a simple hypothesis and when we say p star less than 0 0.5 etcetera, then the distribution is not completely specified. This is known as a composite hypothesis. For example, if I write mu sigma square is equal to 0 1, then this is a simple hypothesis. But if I say theta is equal to 0, then this does not specify sigma square. So, this is a composite hypothesis. So, we have the concept of a simple hypothesis if a hypothesis completely specifies the parameters of a distribution, then it is called a simple hypothesis. Otherwise, it is called a composite hypothesis. So, for example, this is a composite hypothesis, this is a simple hypothesis, this hypothesis is composite because this does not specify sigma, this is composite, this is simple, sorry this is theta here, this is composite these are all composite. Now, a statistician based on a sample will like to test the hypothesis that means, he will give a procedure and he will decide that procedure will try to make a decision in favor of a certain hypothesis. For example, we may say Suppose, we consider a sample of 100 patients, we find that nearly 75 percent of the patient that is 75 patients get cured from the new drug. Then certainly, we may tend to believe that p star is greater than 0 0.5. On the other hand, if may we may find that only 25 out of 100 get cured, then we may say p star is less than 0 0.5. Now, this is a uh, something like you can say a layman's kind of thinking that we can certainly say that if se out of 100, 75 get cured, then it is too large than 50 percent, and therefore we may tend to believe that p star is greater than 0.5. But what happens? Suppose it is in the sampling that we have done, it turns out that out of 100, say 57 patients get cured successfully then would we still be in favor of the statement p star greater than 0 0.5 with the same convincing argument than the previous one? Can we say that it is significantly higher, the effectiveness is significantly more than p star is equal to 0 0.5? Now, that is the question that a statistician would like to answer in a more effective fashion. Similarly, if we are considering say the hypothesis theta is equal to 0 and theta is equal to 1. Now, if we consider a random sample x 1, x 2, x n from the normal distribution, we may consider x bar as an estimate of theta and then you may say that okay, if x bar is 0, then accept h naught and if x bar is equal to 1, then accept h 1. Now, the thing is that if uh, we are considering the sampling from the normal population, 
then x bar is also a normal distribution with mean theta and variance sigma square by n. So, it is a continuous distribution. So, the probability that the x bar is 0 or the probability that x bar is 1 both are equal to 0. Therefore, it does not make sense to give a test of this type and not only that see what happens if x bar is say equal to minus 1, what happens if x bar is equal to say half or what happens if x bar is equal to 2. Therefore, in place of having a point test we may have to give a range, so that we can significantly different differentiate between the two hypotheses H naught and H 1. So, we can say that a test of a statistical hypothesis is a procedure to decide whether to accept or reject a given hypothesis. Now, let us consider say and this will be the decision will be based on a sampling scheme based on a sample. So, let us take an example say x follows binomial say 3 p and our hypothesis is whether p is equal to say 1 by 4 or h 1 p is equal to 3 by 4. So, this is that means, we have considered a sample based on 3 observations out of which we say that x is the number of success. Now, a layman's procedure could be that we may consider a test procedure can be let us call it uh, T 1 T 1 procedure that if x is equal to 0 or 1 then decide in favor of h naught and if x is equal to 2 or 3 then decide in favor of h 1. So, now you can see that this procedure is a heuristic procedure what we are saying is that if x equal to 0 or 1 then it means that number of the proportion of the successes is smaller and therefore, we may say that the probability of success should be smaller and therefore, we go in favor of the hypothesis p is equal to 1 by 4. On the other hand if out of 3 tosses or out of 3 trials you get 2 or 3 success then you may say that the probability of success should be high and you feel that probability p equal to 3 by 4 must be the correct statement and therefore, we decide in favor of h 1. So, we say we give a statement accept h naught and here we say accept h 1 or we can say reject h naught. Since, in the original problem we write one hypothesis as the null hypothesis that means, the initial one and another one as alternative hypothesis we may make the statements like rejecting H naught or accepting H naught or we may say accepting H 1 if we say reject H naught and so on. Now, based on this we are able to, so basically what we are doing we are having the sample space here consisting of 4 points 0, 1, 2, 3 and we are dividing it into 2 parts we call it acceptance region that is 0, 1 and the A complement that is the rejection region we call it 2, 3. So, this is called acceptance region and this is the rejection region. So, basically a test of hypothesis
partitions the sample space into two disjoint sets say a and r where a corresponds to the acceptance of h not and r corresponds to the rejection of h not or you can say acceptance of h 1. So, that is why this a we call to be acceptance region and r we call to be the rejection region or critical region. Since we are basing our decision on the outcome of a random experiment that means, we are doing the sampling therefore, certainly there are there is a chance of error in the form of introducing this type of error. So, we call it two types of errors. So, when we conduct a test of hypothesis based on a random sample, we are likely to make two types of errors. So, first one we call type 1 error that means, rejecting H naught when it is true and second one is called type 2 error that is accepting H naught when it is false. Now, the consequences of the two types of errors can be of various types depending upon different problems. Let us take a example related to uh, say medicine. So, in a medical experiment say tests are conducted on a patient to detect the presence of a certain disease say D. Okay. So, now based on the test we may conclude based on the tests we may conclude. So, your hypothesis is like H naught D is present that means, the person has the disease or H 1 D is not present. So, now you see we may decide to accept or reject H naught. Now, what are the consequences? So, if you look at type 1 error that means, you will we are concluding that rejecting H naught that is we conclude that D is not present whereas, in fact it is present then it may lead to fatal consequences. for the patient. If we consider say type 2 error that means, you conclude that 
d is present whereas, in fact it is not then it may lead to harassment of the patient in terms of unnecessary treatment. leading to monetary loss and health side effects. Now, therefore, in any given problem it is of important to control the two types of errors. So, we give measures for these two types of errors we consider say alpha is equal to the probability of type 1 error that is the probability of rejecting H naught when it is true. And similarly, we consider beta that is equal to probability of type 2 error that is equal to probability of accepting H naught when it is false. So, in any given problem it will be interesting or you can say it will be desirable to control both the errors alpha and beta. Basically, we will like to have them to be a minimum. So, basically it will be the goal to minimize both alpha and beta. However, it is not practically possible. The reason is that if I reduce alpha then beta will increase and if I reduce beta then alpha will increase. You can think from this example that I gave. For this example let us calculate. Let us consider this test T 1 what is alpha here? Alpha is the probability of rejecting H naught that means x equal to 2 or x is equal to 3 when it is true that means when p is equal to 1 by 4 that means is equal to probability of x is equal to 2 when p is equal to 1 by 4 plus probability of x is equal to 3 when p is equal to 1 by 4. So, that is equal to 3 c 2 1 by 4 square 3 by 4 plus 3 c 3 1 by 4 cube. So, you can write this values it is equal to uh, 9 by 64 plus 1. So, that is equal to 10 by 64 that is equal to 5 by 32. Let us look at beta, beta is equal to probability of x is equal to that is probability of accepting h naught when it is false. So, we accept h naught when x equal to 0 or x equal to 1 when it is false that means when p is equal to 3 by 4. So, that is equal to probability of x equal to 0 when p is equal to 3 by 4 plus probability of x equal to 1 when p is equal to 3 by 4. Once again we calculate these quantities it turns out to be 3 c 0 1 by 4 cube plus 3 c 1 3 by 4 into 1 by 4 square. So, once again it is equal to 10 by 64 which is equal to 5 by 32. Now, I design another test say let us consider another test say T 2 okay? that is 
accept h naught when say x equal to 0 and reject h naught when x equal to 0 uh, 1 2 and 3. For this test let us calculate say alpha let me call it alpha 1 uh, say for the test this one I will call it alpha 1 and beta 1. Now, here I will call it alpha 2 and beta 2. So, that is equal to probability of x is equal to 1 plus probability x equal to 2 plus probability x equal to 3 when h naught is true that is p is equal to 1 by 4. So, that is equal to 3 c 1 1 by 4 into 3 by 4 square plus 3 c 2 1 by 4 square 3 by 4 plus 3 c 3 1 by 4 cube that is equal to 27 plus 9 plus 1 by 64 that is equal to 37 by 64 and let us look at say probability of type 2 error then that is becoming probability of x equal to 0 that is probability of accepting h naught when it is false. So, this is simply equal to 1 by 64. So, you can see here that by using this particular test we have been able to reduce beta 2 from 10 by 64 to 1 by 64, but at the same time the probability of type 1 error has increased from 10 by 64 to 37 by 64. In the same way we can consider of reduction of alpha, but then beta will increase. So, therefore, a practical way which the Neyman and Pearson suggested was that we fix an upper level for probability of one type of error and then try to find out a test procedure for which the other type of error is minimum or we can say 1 minus the probability of the other type of error is maximum. So, as a convention it was considered we define power of a test say let us call it gamma that is equal to 1 minus beta that is probability of rejecting h naught when it is false. So, it was proposed to find the tests which for a given So, given value of maximum alpha will have a smallest beta or maximum 1 minus beta that is gamma. So, this was called most powerful test because maximum power most powerful test of size alpha because we put the maximum value of alpha that is called the size of the test or level of significance there are various names of it and we consider the maximum the test which will have the minimum probability of type 2 error or the maximum power that most powerful test. So, the theory of most powerful test So, for simple versus simple case a complete solution was obtained by Neyman and Pearson in 1926 and thereafter it was analyzed to the concept of uniformly most powerful tests later on by the same authors and uh, for composite hypothesis and also for some other situations where even uniformly most powerful test does not exist. So, they considered certain restricted class of tests called unbiased tests and among those tests they found the most powerful test. The his theory of most powerful test was developed 
by Neyman and Pearson in 1926 to 19 say 37 in this period. Uh, so, firstly they considered the solution for the simple versus simple case. So, suppose we have the problem let us write in terms of observations. So, x is say following f x okay. and we make the hypothesis whether f x is equal to f naught x or h 1 f x is equal to f 1 x. So, consider say T x is equal to f 1 x by f naught x. The most powerful test is to reject h naught if f 1 x by f naught x is greater than k. Basically, uh, this is not the complete description. We also have the range. For example, we may have a discrete distribution and in that case, we also have reject h naught this accept h naught if f 1 x by f naught x is less than k. And uh, there was also a portion equal to that is reject with probability say p if f 1 x by f naught x is equal to k. Now, this constant k is chosen to satisfy the size condition. However, uh, even importantly it was that it is not necessary uh, not only sufficient it is also necessary condition for the most powerful test. So, Simultaneously, they did they showed the existence of a such a test, existence of the most powerful test, and also that if there is a most powerful test, it has to be of this form. Now, this turned out to be an extremely useful result, and uh, let me explain through one example. Let us consider. Say a simple testing problem say x 1 x 2 x n say follow normal 0 sigma square. We are having the testing problem say sigma square is equal to 1 against say h 1 sigma square is equal to say 5. Now, let us take <coughs> Let us consider the density function here of all the observations. So, x is equal to x 1 x 2 x n, where your x is equal to x 1 x 2 x n. So, this is equal to 1 by root 2 pi to the power n sigma to the power n e to the power minus 1 by 2 sigma square sigma x i square. So, we consider f 1 x by f naught x that means, the ratio of the densities when sigma square is equal to 5 and when sigma square is equal to 1. So, this will become equal to now this 1 by root 2 pi to the power n will get cancelled out you get 1 by root 5 to the power n e to the power minus 1 by 10 sigma x i square divided by 1 e to the power minus 1 by 2 sigma x i square. So, we consider the rejection region this is greater than some k. Uh, now, this you can write in a modified fashion because this constant I can adjust on the right hand side and it will become e to the power half 
minus 1 by 10 <coughs> sigma x i square greater than some k 1. I can take uh, logarithm here. So, it will reduce to sigma x i square greater than some k 2. Now, we have to choose k 2 such that probability of sigma x i square greater than k 2 under sigma square is equal to 1 is equal to alpha. So, you can easily see that when I am doing the sampling from the normal distributions, I can actually calculate the distribution here. So, under when sigma square is equal to 1, then I have x 1 that is x i is following normal 0 1. This will imply that sigma x i square will follow chi square distribution on n degrees of freedom. If that is so, then this statement is reducing to let us call it say uh, let w denote a chi square n random variable, then we have alpha is equal to probability w greater than k 2. That means, if I am considering a chi square curve on n degrees of freedom, then this k 2 point is actually chi square n alpha that is reject h naught if sigma x i square is greater than chi square n alpha. So, for the most powerful test the rejection region is of this form. So, this is the most powerful critical region for h naught sigma square is equal to 1 against say h 1 sigma square is equal to 5. Let us consider a little generalization of this problem. See you notice here, here I took the null hypothesis 1 and in the alternative sigma square was 5 which was slightly bigger. And therefore, you are seeing here in the denominator uh, we had this minus half here and when we took the difference this becomes a positive quantity. And therefore, the region is in the form sigma x i square greater than k 2. On the other hand suppose I modify this, suppose I consider suppose we have alternative say h 1 star sigma square is equal to say half. If that is so, then in this particular place we will get sigma x i square and if that is happening, then you will get negative quantity here. So, if I take log the region will get reversed, then the critical region will be of the form w less than some k 3. So, if that is so, then if you consider the region, then if I want the probability alpha, then this should be chi square n 1 minus alpha that is w will be less than chi square n 1 minus alpha. So, you can generalize So, we can generalize to this problem. Suppose, I consider sigma square is equal to sigma naught square against sigma square is equal to sigma 1 square and if sigma 1 square is greater than sigma naught square, then reject h naught if w is greater than chi square n alpha and if sigma 1 square is less than sigma naught square then reject h naught if w is less than chi square n 1 minus alpha. This is also uh, pointing out to some 
important characteristic of this distribution when we are considering normal zero sigma square in the density in the exponent we are having sigma x i square as a sufficient statistics and there is a property here actually this is called a monotone likelihood ratio property which is satisfied here and therefore uh, the region of rejection will be decided by the direction in which sigma x i square is taking value so since uh, you can also think of it as a maximum likelihood estimator and from there also you can see that for the larger values of sigma x i square i will favor the hypothesis h1 and for the smaller values i will favor h0 and uh, similarly in the reverse fashion we will consider here for the smaller value i will favor uh, h1 here and for larger values i will favor h0 in the other case when sigma 1 square is less than sigma 0 square uh, in the following lecture, I will give you the tests for various hypotheses which are based on the uh, for the parameters of the normal distributions which are based on this theory. Basically, this results have been extended to the composite hypothesis. For example, I may consider here sigma square less than sigma naught square against sigma square greater than sigma naught square and vice versa. When we consider those situations, we have the uniformly most powerful test. When we have two parameter situations, then we have uniformly most powerful unbiased tests of these hypotheses. Now, without mentioning these things, I will be explicitly giving the tests for the various uh, normal population problems in the next lecture.